Good evening. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Truth About the Falkland Islands page. I would like to make a video and analysis in response to Britain's response to Argentina's recent, le recent letter to the General Assembly regarding the state of affairs uh, regarding the dispute over the Malvinas Falkland Islands. Uh, Britain submitted one response and then later submitted um, an attachment in response to Argentina's response to its first letter. So I'm going to read for the page and also attach uh, below the, um, the PDFs of these two letters. I'm going to read them and paragraph by paragraph give you my own personal interpretation of of what of what the, what to me is going on is is the truth behind the words. Well, before I start, I should clarify that um, I base my my analysis and my opinions on something on a political philosophy uh, that I call Gaia humanism or organic humanism um, and Gaia humanism or organic humanism is basically something that I've conceived myself as an extension or an evolution uh, of the Gaia theory uh, uh, by Jonathan Jonathan Lovelock, God bless his soul. I think he's still alive. Unbelievably, he's either a hundred and one or a hundred and two years old. Um, and Jonathan basically, Mr. Lovelock basically says that Gaia, meaning the integral ecology of the Earth will eventually react to all our assaults and all our damage and uh, survive and sort of kick us out and do away with us. We will die before before the earth, before we kill the earth. And he's one of the founding fathers of uh, the ecological movement and has made us aware of how everything is interconnected, nothing is separate. And so Gaia humanism is sort of uh, an extension in which my idea is that Gaia incorporates humankind rather than um, sort of Gaia be affected by humankind. Eventually the, 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 the more expanded theory is that we are a naturally uh, a natural integral part of life of the life of Gaia, and so that eventually we're, we will catch on and realize that we're hurting and destroying our own home, and as uh, survival and evolution is the prime directive of all living forms, something somehow will we'll realize that um, we have to change, we have to heal and recuperate, recover, restore our planet, and uh, Gaia as a whole will prevail, mankind included, which is uh, sort of a, another level forward from the Gaia theory, I believe. In any case, um, and the basis or the essence of Gaia humanism is that there is a natural design, as ecological sciences demonstrate and Jonathan Lovelock demonstrates. Um, there is a design and um, a natural way in which things work out socially and biologically. Um, what Gaia humanism proposes as a uh, scientific understanding of the way our mind works is that basically we're ruled by two major forces and all life forms are the same except that humankind is much much more exaggerated or uh, developed this way um, 
And basically those forces are the natural, intuitively occurring um, consciousness or biological consciousness of our intelligence, that part of us that simply kind of knows things without too much uh, reasoning, without telling us what we ought to think about things, but we simply know. Um, and the other part of our intelligence is uh, analytical, logical intelligence. The uh, analytical, logical intelligence um, also pulls forward the, 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 the primary uh, purpose of our life form in that it seeks to have us survive and excel in our existence and proliferate and thrive except that it does it through a the, uh, its own nature of thinking, the analytical, logical part of our brain that invents, that analyzes, and uh, creates and builds and, um, and come ups with, uh, comes up with systems or uh, complicated analysis of how things work. So this part of our brain is not really in harmony with um, with the natural part, uh, natural half of our conscious intelligence, um, they ultimately have the same purpose, but one sort of our logical intelligence sort of betrays or unwittingly undermines what is uh, ultimately uh, healthiest and best for us. Um, not always, uh, but its tendency is to be mistaken, and we can plainly see that in civilization. We invent chemicals to preserve foods that end up poisoning us. We invent weapons uh, for whatever reason, and we end up killing our own children. We think things are right, and we think that we know how to work our inventions, and then we discover later that they are harming us, um, or that we were mistaken how we believed things should be. There's a, a paradigm, in other words, and a, a perpetual imbalance between these two spheres, these two halves of our brain, our intelligence. Oh boy, I can't stop now, because this is the first time I do it live. Okay, so, this being the case, I mean, this basically um, presents the basis for Gaia humanist rationale. We acknowledge that we are in this predicament, in this existential predicament of, uh, in our in our um, an ambitious and and uh, precocious ability to thrive and survive better than any other animal uh, species in, uh, on the planet, we also have a tendency to continually want to trip and not really understand what our natural um, call is, is, is simply, uh, simply is. Uh, to give an example of this paradigm or this comparison, it's like saying there is the intelligent part of our brain that simply thinks, oh, I'm, I'm hungry, and you know that that fruit or that vegetable is food, and you can just walk over and satisfy your appetite. Or maybe it's time to grab an animal or open the fridge and grab some meat. Um, and the awareness of what is, for example, if it's about to rain, you just know that you don't want to get wet and you have what you have at, at your disposal to protect yourself of the rain or of the cold. Um, and th this basic, natural, biological, spontaneous, intuitive intelligence in, in, in tune with, with creation, with life on Earth, also has its social, um, its social caliber, its, its, uh, its understanding simply who is most important, your children, your grandparents, uh, the people that create your community. There is no need for a logical, civil construct for, for a lot of these things that you simply know. In, con in contrast, when uh, the same person becomes hungry, they may think, uh, well, 
but it's not dinner time yet, and uh, today it's not my turn to decide what, what we cook, and it's this other person's turn to cook in the family, for example, and we eat at 9 o'clock, and it's my turn to make to set the table, and we have customs, and we have ways by which we have organized our society, and our, our, um, our understanding of eating, of food, of, of how, to, how to handle our appetite. And so, the two, these two sides, exist... Uh, in, in a singular human intelligence, yet there are two spheres that um, that sort of don't ever have, have never have peace, uh, have or at least we have not learned how to harmonize um, and really uh, prioritize what is ultimately healthiest healthiest for the for life, for our own sustenance, for the design of the species. Uh, and the health of Gaia and so forth. We still we have started on some ecological sciences and we have started on many ideas. But you know that our tendency is to is to veer off, and all of a sudden, it, a lot of our green ecological ideas have become about capitalism and, and or 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 law and and uh, not um, no longer honor the essential reason that gave. Uh, the realization of their truth. Well, so this can, you know, the ironic part of this, to give another example, um, divorce laws, for example, uh, we understand in, the, in those human sciences that are closest to our organic biological intelligence that the child um, is formed and shaped to mature and understand society and people by the rearing of the male and the female parent, and all of this will will sort of uh, um, will form and shape the maturing of the boy or the girl according to the relationships between the mother and the father, and and we know that that's how we grow our the strength of our morality and the strength of our psychology is has to do with our relationship with uh, the nurturing of our parents. And yet, we have designed, for example, divorce laws that have, you know, been built on certain ideologies uh, or ideas that have to do with other beliefs. And as a consequence, our divorce laws look more like... Um, you know, like they respond to situations that uh, have to do with uh, making sure that only the mother is is important in the rearing of the child, and the father provides economic sustenance, and he doesn't really need to come around or anything, but he can just mail that check in and provide alimony or what have you. And in reality, these laws are not putting the the formation and the maturing of the child at the center, because otherwise these laws would be designed differently. They would um, sort of um, encourage or 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 be built on the premise that the parents must be always available uh, and part of the development of that child and all its activities, even if they don't want to live together. Laws would have made for a society that understand they are built around the development of the child. They're not built around the needs of, of this couple that no longer gets along and how to work that out, but they're sort of, it is expected of the parents to first take care of the child in whatever divorce conditions they, they are. So the, the, the law are Law divorce, or divorce laws, look completely different to what they look like today. Um, so, <clears throat> it's also, uh, it also needs, before I start reading the letters uh, of the UK to the United Nations, another thing I want to I uh, explain, at, which is at the basis of my rationale and my analysis, is that uh, humankind is 
the owner of its own laws. A lot of times you hear people that say, well, you know, punish the criminal, they broke the law, nothing else matters, you know, the law is supreme above all things. Laws are really a reaction and a consequence. They, they spin off things that come from that organic, natural, human half of our brain. We intuitively and sensibly have notions that we know are simply true and are sought by everybody pretty much the same if they were in that situation. And so um, we understand that uh, the complexity of society and civilization gets in the way of things, of uh, what would be the harmonious flow of a small community. Things get complicated and power levels of power and subjugation in a complex, large society start um, going haywire and a lot of injustice, a lot of crisis, a lot of stress and tension starts occurring and so laws attempt to find what is fair and just and true and establish it as a rule for everybody. Now, who makes those laws and rules? We do. <laughs> we are the ones that say anybody would, uh, you know, let's say everybody has a right to have a home over a shelter or access to some land. Um, and, um, and so we kind of initially all acknowledge and recognize that this is human, that this is common, and because our, this complex civilization that we have ended up in is making that uh, right very difficult. We make laws, housing laws, for example, for a country, which eventually, because they're, they're run and they're created and written by people who are tend to be in privileged power positions where perhaps they're not the ones suffering homelessness, for example. They go by ideas and ideals and ideologies that come from wherever. They decide that, um, you know, you have to earn... Uh, you have to be able to pay so much money to have a roof over your head. And they become laws that are seem, they purport to be fair, but in reality they're, they don't do justice to the natural right of every human being. And as such, all of the all of the laws of this world are imperfect and inadequate. If one goes back to that moment in which they were spun, and generated by something that the majority, if not everybody, understood to be fair, true, and natural, uh, and all agreed on and until it was taken away from the hands of the of the of uh, the open collective and put in the realm of people that design and write laws uh, according to what they think is best, and so the local analytical part of the brain sort of ran wild with the creation of laws and started departing uh, from the from what is true, from what is universally 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 be uh, concorded upon intuitively or what have you. So um, it is important that we don't forget who creates the laws. One, because their tendency and their nature is to to veer towards being mistaken, unfair, and just. Uh, some stay close enough to justice and to where they don't suscitate, they don't provoke uh, enough reaction or disgruntledness. Uh, and, and some are really off. And to people protest, this, this is ridiculous. How can we be going by this law when clearly we can see here and there by common sense that it's absurd, it makes no sense. And those laws even go on for a long time. Um, in international sovereignty laws, it's no different. They were designed by our logical analytical mind, and this is the logical analytical part of the human brain that created the United Nations, that created this, all the systems of government that have ever existed. Um, and if you look at the, what uh, international law considers sovereignty, you will find several um, instances one of which is the truest one, which is um, that sovereignty is recognized by others as much as 
it is earned. It is not um, defined and is not uh, word, uh, valid by simply citing. Let's say, for example, I always give the, the example of a group of people um, venturing, sailing off to deserted islands, and they're like a yacht club, or um, and they, they decide, hey, let's all go to that beach and hang out there, right? And so they all put their boats outside the beach, and they, they anchor their boats <laughs> At the, at the harbor and they all arrive at this deserted island and this beach that has never been populated by anybody and everybody kind of walks onto the beach at the same time. Um, try to put yourself in, in, that, in that moment along with these people and you will start visiting what is the, the, the area where uh, later laws were written and rules were created, uh, but which give rise to the first notions to do with sovereignty. And so some people maybe see a stream or a brook and they realize that it's good to be close to the water, but everybody knows that. It's not, it doesn't belong to the person that first sees the stream. Uh, everybody that arrives at the beach go, oh look, there's the water. Okay, that everybody without being told kind of knows well nobody should hog that up because everybody needs water it doesn't uh, sovereignty is not established either by saying hey look at how beautiful that cape over there is or by dropping your towel and saying and then disappearing for the whole day and then saying well i left my towel there in the morning and sometimes but you know all these things get worked out you know in a place that there aren't really any fixed rules. What does clearly start defining sovereignty to everybody on the beach that has already, you know, come ashore is that somebody has decided to hang around and stay in one place and maybe started building a shelter with rocks, you know, and and maybe some friends come and go to that from that person at that same spot all the time and you can clearly recognize that that person is not only has not only chosen that but he has something going on he's permanently um, staying in that place and this is what in any one of us starts defining that somebody has a right to that space not just because they called it out not just because they saw it uh, but because they actually started living there well we find this in international law uh, unfortunately, it's not um, in a hierarchy of, you know, this is the most important r rules above all the other, uh, all other ideas uh, regarding sovereignty. There's other definitions um, at the United Nations or Geneva, <laughs> wherever <laughs> these things are written, that um, address sovereignty. And one of them, for example, is, has to do with our most destructive unnatural activity which is to bully another with weapons and in war war is nothing but the ability to uh, vacate reason and say I'm gonna I'm gonna establish what I believe in and what I feel is my justice regardless of you or your life or whatever is going on with you because I can do it with the force of weapons now sometimes both countries apply that, but it doesn't make it any less uh, defining of what war actually is. War is the end of communication and um, where we have no more patience to understand the subtleties or the complexities uh, and what would have intuitively been brought to our attention as humanly fair to the other person. We just kind of get tired of of being intelligent human beings and we resort to being apes and <laughs> we, we decide to grab the stone and go for it and, and kill the, the opposition. And yet, <laughs> um, there, is, uh, there are some definitions of sovereignty with ha which have to do with uh, having earned uh, a place by virtue of invasion and and war and, and the other people not having done enough in, after a certain amount of time to recuperate that and other things that are, um, you know, that perhaps we, we should totally um, 
revise and see if they're not causing more problems than they're solving um, through the United Nations. Uh, but in any case, so these are, uh, this is kind of the contextual area in which I analyze uh, things. Uh, I'm not really uh, analyzing these letters according to my vast knowledge on how the United Nations or international law works. I, um, I am sort of analyzing from the human uh, Gaia humanist or, or humanist organic uh, thinking that is actually something, it's a, a way of structuring rationale, a way of using our natural human reasoning that anybody can do. Anybody can use the structure of Gaia humanism and how we understand why the world was built the way it was and where it, how it's all structured and what made us do what. Um, to later be able to, as a tool to um, look at anything we may want to look in so far as disputes in the world or conflicts, political conflicts, uh, what is justice, what is you know, we we may think that some things are fair according to the United Nations or the International Court of Justice, but you know, don't, let's not forget that these instruments, the, United, the International Court of Justice and the United Nations, were created by the countries that had the wealth, the power, and the the communications prowess. They were they came out of a war, and everybody was just stunned at the power of these nuclear weapons and it seemed like they knew what they were doing and they had good intentions and so everybody subscribed to things which were done by human beings. Human beings which also possess a logical, analytical, selfish, and secure uh, human intelligence that may even, we may even fool ourselves into thinking this is altruistic or this is global, this is fair for anybody, but in reality what we're doing is we're using things that we are um, we are very capable of wielding and they are uh, systems and principles uh, used through uh, language that we can easily work and so they ultimately benefit more the creators as we can see uh, the United Nations, when you look at what things are talked about, um, it really seems like it's working at the service of a few countries and not doing much for um, countries in the middle. It seems like it does something for countries that have intense problems of hunger or or war, but really it's not doing what it what it proposed or what it said it wanted to do, which is to end wars, to bring peace to the world, to keep the world from going to war. <laughs> Instead, what it's doing, it seems to be managing a war. It seems to be formalizing war with rules and things that would be a fair situation for a war. And, and that basically is only benefiting the countries at war, the countries that are not just very capable uh, and much more powerfully able to war other countries, but also countries that are drawing a lot of benefit from from wars in the world. So um, I'm not meaning to be irreverent to the United Nations. I feel that the United Nations needs to continue uh, because it's the only instance in human civilization that all countries have signed up, have signed on around a round table, sort of say, and that is incredible. That is something fantastic that should not be chucked out. At the same time, it is in urgent need of transformation and fair and equal representation and power to be distributed among all of the world's nations if each country is going to be equally represented. Uh, it's far from that. Okay, so in, after making, in, with these points being made, um, I'm now going to proceed to read the letters and just give you my personal thoughts. And like I said, like I alluded to before, 
a lot of the, you will see that a lot of the passion uh, and the, the, um, the premises and the, and the reason why Argentina so uh, strongly continues arguing and will not let go of this has to do with what I just explained, which is you kind of know that you're right. You know that in the human sense, in the intuitive sense, in the natural sense, there's something here that constantly keeps reminding you that you're on the right, that there's no way that they can be right through taking by force something and refusing to acknowledge openly negotiations before the world. Um, you can see, for example, that um, Britain and Argentina are not arguing openly and saying, well, you know, trying to really believing in their respective uh, criteria and therefore arguing common points and saying, well, that is true, that wouldn't be true. Uh, no, there, it's a completely different situation. It's like one is saying one thing and the other one is saying something else. Britain has um, created a narrative that uh, you see a motivation behind it is all about affirming that narrative. It's not about that narrative confronting uh, the same narrative the Argentinians have where they explain it in a way that they would be right uh, versus the British explaining it in a way that they believe to be right. It's more like they don't meet each other. The British have, say these things, they never, they never have common points of confrontation, argumentative confrontations with Argentina. And the Argentinians have a narrative that is completely ignored, that they sustain and the British simply say, no, it's not true. This is what's actually true, and this, these are the reasons why we're carrying on. And so they want it to be about what they believe in. And uh, that's one thing that makes this um, conflict unique. There are a lot of things that make this conflict very interesting and unique. It's almost like a looking glass at the, at, at the human condition of, of confrontation in, in, in our... In our civilization, human civilization. It shows a lot of our nature, but without going off somewhere, I'm just going to go ahead and start analyzing this. So, uh, dated September 24th, 2020, uh, to the United Nations General Assembly. The first response by the British to Argentina's claim um, and denouncement is that... Uh, 75th is, is for the 75th session, agenda item 8, general debate, letter dated 23, September 23rd, 2020, from the Charchet Affairs I, of the Permanent Mission of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to the United Nations Address to the Secretary, the Secretary General. In accordance with the published instructions for the right to reply, the United Kingdom would like to exercise the right to of reply in response to the statement of the distinguished representative of Argentina. On September 22nd, under the agenda, under agenda item 8 of the 75th session of the General Assembly, general, general debate, the representative of Argentina made reference to uh, the United Kingdom's sovereignty over the Falkland Islands and South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands further to which the United Kingdom wishes, to, Kingdom wishes to place the following statement in the official record of proceedings. I always find it very interesting to look at language because when you have somebody read something uh, very subliminally, you're also telling them to understand things this way, and that is very deliberate, especially in these kinds of letters. So, for example, this is a very little example, but... Uh, made uh, the representative of Argentina made reference to the United Kingdom's sovereignty over the Falkland Islands. It is not saying the, uh, something that would be closer to the truth, which is the representative of Argentina made reference to the United Kingdom usurping, because that is the complaint and the denouncement put before the United Nations, 
uh, the United Kingdom usurping uh, of the Falkland Islands or Malvinas Islands. Uh, but in any case, let's continue. Um, the United Kingdom has no doubt about its sovereignty over the Falkland Islands and South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands and surrounding maritime areas of both territories, nor about the principle and the right of self-determination for the Falkland Islanders as enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations and in Article 1 of the two International Covenants on Human Rights, by virtue of which they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Okay, so first of all, what the United Kingdom is doing here is basically presenting, uh, saying, I'm, we're only going to argue things according to how I'm defining them, which is what I explained before. This is what's going on. We're not, there's no talk about sovereignty. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about anything that happened before because they don't really want to move they, they need to solidify their logistic strategy. They need it to be intact. They cannot be having people going and saying, well, if this happened before in 1820, and how about that? And what, what effect did the Americans in 1831 have uh, upon the islanders that were there when you came and took the islands from the Argentinians? They don't want people to go there at all. So they basically cut and dry want to start from 1833, which is when they came to move over, move aside the Argentinians. And um, there is no encounter. They completely avoid avoid encountering Argentina in any kind of argument. That this, is, this is really the essence of, the, of, of British strategy regarding the dispute. Um, and, then it's, uh, and then it goes on to say, and it's because of the rights of the islanders, because, you know, and, and it wants it to be about, um, about um, non-self-governing territory values and charters and articles in the United Nations and the people's right to self-determination based on all of these um, items of the United Nations that have to do with supposedly old empires or powers conceding and, and acknowledging that those countries that were invaded or occupied or conquered have the right to free to freedom, to recover their nations, to speak their mind, in other words, to speak their mind in order to establish that they uh, have the right to be the people that they have always been. And so it's an attempt by um, the old empires through the United Nations to say we're we're going to make good on on no longer running colonies on on uh, respecting people's right to their own nations and and it all has to do with these principles of human rights to sort of self determination and so forth. Well, there's a big problem with this, and Argentina knows it, and here is where the lock. The lockdown, or the sort of the the locking situation, occurs when Argentina um, said, "Well, we're making good on the Spanish occupation, on the Spanish possession of the Malvinas, and we're putting our flag now in 1820." And the British don't want to recognize that. For example, uh, they established. Uh, you know, the integration of the Malvinas and um, sort of underlined the fact that it was already part of Buenos Aires' um, administration, ju ju uh, jurisdiction, even before independence. And so they simply kind of flowed, they sort of created the nation with the notion, they, uh, uh, independent, Argentina became independent or became a nation including the notion that they were already coming with the islands because the islands were uh, part of the Spanish Empire. And this is also an area that Britain doesn't want to, you know, because if you, if you start arguing whose were they, the British or the Spanish, they really can't say they were ours. 
because it seems like it really was more of the Spanish, the British left, the Spanish stayed on. They lost to the Spanish, and there was a bunch of explanations that kind of tend to favor that really they were Spanish more than they were British. Although we're talking about a time in history in which the Spanish Empire was starting to decline, and the British Empire was getting stronger. And this condition, it also um, kind of fogs up the clarity of, of, of truth. Um, but I don't want to get lost, but it all started because the Spanish and the Portuguese started, you know, uh, t colonizing the world, the, the New World, before the British did. The British kind of followed in their, and you know, learned from what they were doing. They were getting maps. They started doing their own, you know, from them. They were having, you know, whenever they they uh, pirate attacked a, a ship, they made sure to keep maps, you know, because they wanted to catch up and take what the Spanish uh, had gotten rich with. And they were also starting their own thing, you know, in North America. But basically, they were trailing and. In this historical timeline, um, what the Spanish established, or Argentina establishes, is that the Pope, we're also talking about a time that Britain first was Catholic and then was now transitioning to Protestant, and so they were, there was like a respect for the Pope versus a non-respect anymore for the Pope, uh, you know, and so all of these factors, actually, if you are going to understand how things unfolded, there is a lot more sophistication that needs to be worked in to how things started developing. But in, in generally, um, just to make it simple, the Pope had, in, had decided uh, between Portugal and Spain, because these were the first countries that were colonizing, um, especially South America, that in order for them to not fight, there is a line drawn, you know, and and so west of this line was Portugal, and I mean, our Spanish, no, wait, west of this line was Spanish, and east of that line was Portuguese, and the Malvinas fell within the Spanish side. And so when the French got to the islands, and were the first ones to actually build a settlement, and a year later, I think the British also, um, the Spanish arrived, neither French nor Spanish, knowing that the English had made a little fort on the other island, uh, argued and said, yeah, okay, fine, you know, we understand, you believe this is yours, the Spanish paid for whatever inconvenience, and I uh, conceded that the islands belonged to Spain, and then the Spanish found out the English were there, and they fought, and, you know, there was a back and forth thing, they lost, the British lost, and then the, um, and then they were, came back or whatever, and was, but they ended up leaving after, they didn't stay more than three or four years in that little settlement called Port Egmont. And 55 years passed, or 45 or 55, I don't know, without really anybody doing anything on these islands, these are harsh hard to uh, settle islands, there was a bunch of other more important things happening in the rest of the world. And so the Argentine, but you know, pretty much uh, as far as Buenos Aires was, was concerned, the islands were put under the jurisdiction of uh, administration of Buenos Aires. The Spanish made, told Buenos Aires, okay, you take care of that part of our empire, the Malvinas. Uh, and so by 1820, being that this was sort of a, also a no man's chaotic place where the lawlessness um, was rampant and people did whatever they wanted, um, they said, "Well, you know, we're going to be, we'll bring order and, and uh, administrative order to these islands, and since they're, we are breaking from the Spanish, we will uh, bring our administration." So in 1820, they sent. Uh, 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 American, what's it called, pirateer or some something, um, who went over there representing Argentina and planted the Argentinian uh, privateer uh, flag, 
and the Argentinians were starting to, uh, from that moment on, to understand that the Malvinas were becoming assimilated into the nation they were starting, they they were starting to want to form, which started in 1810, and then officialized by 1816. Now the British, who basically had an argument with the Spanish, uh, didn't didn't really have the islands as a priority. Um, they, uh, in fact, the Spanish left officially their claim to the islands in 1810, because they were, uh, 1811, because they were losing to South American nations and they were just uh, having a lot of problems. And so this is even a stronger signal to the Argentinians to say, okay, well, they're, they're leaving, you know, we're, we were left with the islands. And the British didn't, were not preoccupied with any immediacy about these islands, uh, they, we, we, we shouldn't forget that these are uh, ex empires that were trying, they, they have expansionist, they had expansionist policies. They wanted to own and grab land by the use of force in order to exploit them for their uh, mon uh, metropolis. Argentina was looking right from the get-go, right from the start, was looking at this very differently. They were saying, we're becoming a republic one of the new modern constitutional republics like the United States. This is going to be an integral part of our country. And the British, who simply, of course, is no effort to continue repeating, no, those are our islands, even though they did nothing to settle them. After they left Port Egmont for those 50 years, they didn't do anything about making good on, on, on the Spanish withdrawal, for example. They still didn't care. But when they saw that the um, the Argentinians, uh, actually at first, the Argentinians were able to uh, create a settlement in 1827, Bernay was there, and they built houses, which is another definition of true sovereignty, to build, to they took livestock, they had people that would come over and recognize them as Argentine rep administrative representation and stay with them. Um, the, the Verne took his family, and there were uh, Argentinians um, being born on the islands. For the first time, there was a nationality um, uh, adjudicated, or however you say it, to a nation because by the virtue of being born on the islands. There were two or three. There, we know of two people, and perhaps there were other, another three or another two people that were considered Argentinian. When um, whalers and sealers came by, this is important because it's all the stuff that, that the, the, the British narrative before the United Nations wants to completely avoid. They want to say that, you know, they arrived at 1833 and had, it was their islands and they had to remove the Argentinians because the Argentinians, wanted, they don't want to explain really the intricacies and the true um, areas of worth, of true um, definition that were going on by that time. Um, so Verne, who wanted to start making these islands productive, um, kind of walked the, there's also an argument about how if he, he asked permission, he walked a, a tightrope, he walked the middle, he knew that the British I mean, if you're a country that's a, a military power, you can say whatever you want, and you can scare people, right? You can tell them, we don't, who cares if we're not, those are our islands, even though we're not doing anything with them, just in case we may want to. These are, and so, um, Verne was wise, and he, though he was sent to Malvinas by Argentina, he dealt with the British because he wanted to succeed. And whatever he did and, 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 and uh, talked about with the British back then, which is not, which should be more important, um, uh, was what it was, in order, because it felt that he, it gave him some safety. So, Rene tries to run these islands, and whalers and sealers come and exploit 
you know, and so he says, well, I'm, I got to, I got to do good by Argentina. I got to establish, um, you know, natural resource regu uh, rules um, by which people who come here to to hunt seal should abide by, right? Hey, hey, Wahid. And um, I wasn't looking at the, I wasn't looking at the, at the screen. Okay, so what does he do? He, you know, he sees some whalers and he decides to find them and sequester their ships. They were American and so they complain uh, and the United States government sends Silas Duncan over to basically take revenge. Uh, the United States did not want to acknowledge Argentina as uh, with any rightful uh, of any right to the uh, Falkland Islands to the Malvinas. They didn't say they were British because, and I'll explain why. They just they just wanted they just didn't want rules. They didn't want regulations. They wanted to be able to go to these islands and grab seals and whales and not be bothered by anybody. Um, and so, which already shows, even back then, way back then, already a, a complete lack of respect and condescendence towards a new emerging Hispanic country um, by from the United, by the United States. And so, the United States government uh, gives permission to um, to Silas Duncan to go down there and take it out on you know vent his revenge. And Silas Duncan goes down there and blows to bits. The Argentine settlement was called Puerto Luis. And this is something that I am always emphatic about. They're talking about Puerto Argentino and whether they should go back to Stanley. The Argentinians call it Stanley or not call it Stanley. And the Argentinians say it's called Puerto Argentino. Well, this is completely off from the true uh, um, story of the, of the islands. The Argentinians were in a place called Puerto Luis, which today is completely ignored. The islanders don't want to remi be reminded of that, the British don't want to be reminded of that, and for some reason the Argentinians don't feel that what they should be upset about is the destruction of Puerto Luis by the Americans. That is where it all starts. The Americans go back and say now it's nobody's country or no man's land or once again so it's not like the americans believed that it was but nonetheless they inform the british empire that they went and destroyed the the settlement of puerto luis so the british who by this point had were aware that the argentinians were starting to um, increasingly uh, do more about incorporating the old Spanish islands or th these islands that they also say should be theirs uh, into their nation before they because the Argentinians were completely pummeled, their settlement destroyed but you know they just kept tenaciously saying well, no, 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 you know th these are our islands we're gonna go but they sent another governor and they try to see if they could get it going get the settlement Puerto Luis going again, and uh, it wasn't as successful as Vernet was running it, and so before they did get really well settled and established even more loudly and clearly their true sovereignty, the British said, okay, enough, you know, we're, we're taking these islands, and they went down there in 1833, and they like to say that it was something very very inconsequential, you know, that they asked people if they wanted to stay, they want to play that down, but there's no getting around forcing somebody to lower a flag so they could raise their own flag and prefer possibly more than likely um, were not interested in those that felt more responsibility and accountability for towards Buenos Aires about, about the running of the islands, the administration of the islands to go back and offered some people to stay if they so well pleased. Well, you know, they whoever tried to run these islands needed people there. 
So it's not surprising that the British wanted to act with passivity and just invite people to stay, please, if they wanted to, right? And more than likely were not interested in those that more vehemently were upset at their occupation, which they don't want to call an occupation, of course. So, okay, so giving this um, brief summary, it needs to be understood that the islands were not settled by British people. They were a mix of people, including some English people, but mainly uh, run by the Argentinians and Spanish, people in Buenos Aires, uh, um, you know, responding and being supplied by the harbors in Buenos Aires and Montevideo. They, they, kind of, they went to the administration of Montevideo when the Spanish started losing to the Argentinians. They said, well, we're, gonna, we're keeping the island, so they passed them to Uruguay, which was still under... Uh, the, the you know the monarchy whatever you call it the rebel not the rebels the opposite the ones that fight for the king right uh, before Uruguay gained its independence and so um, but Buenos Aires was always the hub of of what was going to become either a big nation including Uruguay and Paraguay or maybe smaller nations even than what they are today there was a, just a bunch of fighting going on. And so they were pretty much left with the overriding uh, sense, felt entitlement to these islands. Um, now, the British want to make it about the right of the islanders and uh, to self-determination and uh, with hues and connotations of colonialism uh, being righted, when in reality it is not. <laughs> Uh, the islanders were brought by Britain to the islands 11 years after they kicked out the Argentinians. Now, the Argentinians protested immediately. A year later, they were sending letters and they even sent their own diplomat to try to talk to British government officials in England. I mean, right away, it's not like the Argentinians... Uh, didn't really care. It was the British that didn't really care until they saw that they were going to lose them to the Argentinians. Then all of a sudden they started pulling. But the Argentinians never had that kind of attitude. They always just felt, well, you know, this is part of what we're inheriting from what the Spanish were occupying down here. Um, so when it, it became immediately a dispute. What's interesting about the Malvinas is that they were never not disputed. If it wasn't the Spanish, it was the French, it was the British, you know, and even right away, as the British moved the Argentinians off the islands, the Argentinians started saying, no, wait, no, these are our islands, you know, they belong to us now. And um, so the British, 11 years later, send people. It's not a colonial, it's not a, a population that was there and today through the United Nations the British ought to do right by them. No, they were sent to the islands as a way of in, uh, reinforcing their occupation of the islands. So right off the bat, Britain is, you can tell that it's cheating. It's saying, it's defining the, the conflict in, uh, by a description that is not true to what actually happened. In fact, the British um, first wanted to be more militaristic about their uh, occupation of the islands because they, they knew the Argentinians were left smoldering and that they were uh, not a passive people. They were not like, you know, some of the other Hispanic countries. They were, uh, you know, there was a lot of Spanish militant blood and people that were getting educated in Britain and France and um, they were, they had, there's a lot of uh, political intellectualism happening in Buenos Aires and so they knew that they were, you know, they were left kind of ticked off and yet, this is what's most interesting about this conflict, and yet the, Ar uh, the Argentinians, like all other Hispanic nations, were really, uh, they didn't start off magnificently like America, you know, with a lot of power and industry and production. Uh, you know, they were struggling and they had some some advantages that they worked on and 
it was very important for them to, they felt, to catch up to Europe and to America and to create their republics as, as well as the United States had, was creating. And, and, you know, they saw the United States going and conquering Mexican territory, and so they felt they needed to be, but in reality, the substance was just not there. And so all of the Latin American nations start off with this kind of, uh, we want to be our own republics, half selling out to the devil kind of politics in which their own politicians would be friends with the British. Um, and the British basically started having a a policy of interventionism with most of South America. They acted as friends, but what they wanted were these people to be in power, not those other people. And they started, you know, providing arms and weapons and money so that they would attack each other. And, and you know, they, but the Latin American countries, Hispanic countries were not quite, um, they're not quite wise to this. They didn't understand how important it is to you know, shut all doors and be integrally uh, sovereign. Uh, they kept thinking that European countries were were just who they had to be with, and so they, for example, they kept dealing with them, and then they would the European countries would turn and either invade or 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 mediate in favor of them instead of mediate in favor of two countries that were arguing in South America. And, you know, this is a problem in which all these countries started with, started off as. Um, and so this is why, uh, you know, the, the occupation of, of the Malvinas by the British starts off saying, we better, you know, we better make sure that we're strong about this because the Argentinians were starting to... But then they, they saw that there were a lot of needs that the Argentinians were, were also in a lot of problems and... There weren't any resources going on for them. And so they went for a more passive uh, administrative um, uh, attitude about the islands, in part because of something that somebody that was sent there as an administrator or what have you said, you know, we don't, we don't want all this military presence here or militant presence. We, we just want to be able to... The Argentines are not really representing a military threat. And this pretty much set the tone uh, for 150 years, practically, uh, until 1982. Because while the Argentinians never let go of their complaint that they were kicked off the islands and that they should belong to them, at the same time, it was important for them to grow economically, and they were all proud about British cultural influence, and they thought that all European nations were their friends, and they were kind of like a, a European satellite, and so... Um, this is why it completely surprised everybody in the world, practically, when that war would happen. Okay, so um, I'm going to read on, but and I can't pause the video, so I need to go to the bathroom really quick. Right Okay, I wasn't I wasn't counting on thinking of that problem. Okay, so let's continue on with the letter, the first letter. So yeah, the you know so now the uh, Great Britain wants to make it all about the islanders, obviously because by making it about already the world is convinced that rights to self-determination that, you know, anyways, I don't want to get into that. It's too difficult to explain. Maybe later. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the human political status and phenomena. This means there can be no dialogue on sovereignty unless the Falkland Islands, so, Falkland Islanders so wish. In, two th in 2013, the 2013 referendum in which... 99.8% of those who voted wanted to remain their 
current status as a territory of the United Kingdom sent a clear meshes, message that the people on the islands do not do not want to dialogue on sovereignty. Argentina should respect those wishes. Right. So, um, very interesting. The referendum is very interesting because, for one thing, if there was a true worldly, common to the world kind of conflict, the typical kind of thing that happens throughout history regarding sovereignty between two countries that have a history over arguing and regarding a place, and it was really understood as a complex matter, it would be very unlikely that everybody, everybody, on a tiny in a tiny little village, which is Stanley, which only has two thousand people. I don't know back then with the people in the, in the military base. You did the soldiers also vote? I don't know. <laughs> I, never, I never looked at that up. Did the British soldiers vote? But in any case, very unlikely that. Um, I bet some of them did. In any case, um, not not five, not ten percent, or fifteen percent, or twenty percent would have said, "Well, you know, I I don't necessarily want to be an Argentine territory, but I think that I I I don't want Britain to continue ruling my the islands I live on. I'm going to vote no." That doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, there, being run by Argentina was not an option. The option on the referendum was, <laughs> do you, I'm just laughing, okay. do you want to leave things as they are and continue being ruled and run by the British or not? It's almost like Britain needed a piece of paper to later sh take to the United Nations and say, see, the people on the island say this, and so we're just going by what they're saying. You know, we're just obeying what. And the whole you can you can just you know place yourself during the, that time on on and, and 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 watch people talk to one another, and and you could see what the sentiment towards Argentinians universally was by from anybody anybody that you that lives on the island, it's all part of a social kind of conditioning of, of how to feel about that situation, how to think about Argentina that has been cultivated ever since the War of 82, that has got everybody pretty much only um, thinking along a certain narrative, one way of understanding and feeling about the Argentinian. And so, it, you can almost see, you can almost guess that everybody knew everybody was gonna they were probably laughing about it what are you i'm gonna vote yes of course i'm gonna vote yes too i'm gonna vote yes too you know it wasn't really something democratic yet they want to they want to use the referendum as something democratic this has been written about this has been better than me described better than how i just did um and so again they want to use they want to endow the islanders with a power of deciding over the, over uh, on the sovereignty matter based on principles and values that have to do with colonialism in the united nations but and and in reality <laughs> If the Argentinians had realized how the British were were working everything, because it was the British themselves who listed <laughs> their own islands as an occupied non-self-governing territory of the United Nations, of which they themselves are the administrator. So this way they leave out of the loop completely Argentina's protest uh, that would have sounded more like part of their territory was taken from them in 1833. The Argentinians never counter, never thought the British controlling the definition of this conflict, and so they're able to carry on 
define with their narrative and they do not and they really do not want there to be a crack in any in any way and so they um, passed a referendum for this reason and then there's just a score of lies constant there's this play between what is proposed by the islanders or what is uh, what is sourced or comes from the islands and what it comes from London, if it's convenient for the narrative to say that the Falkland Island government, the Falkland Island government is the one who who proposed the referendum, that's what they say, and that is what they say, but it could have been most likely an idea that came from London, and they said, you know, we've got to make it sound like it was an idea proposed by the Falkland Islands. This is completely the the condition that infests this conflict it's all about working those two voices it's all about working well you know um, it, it is for them it is the Falkland Islands government's interest or you know and we're just out over here we're just protecting their rights Oh, like they never put the people there to make sure they could keep the islands from falling from from Argentina's claim. Like they're not the one who are mostly more greatly interested in in keeping these islands. Perhaps more than the Falklanders themselves. Um, the Falklanders even don't uh, don't want independence. Now the British kind of want them to to want independence because they can continue this uniformity through a completely um, developed separation like a, a new little country like a, then incorporated as a you know, commonwealth province or something what's really interesting about this conflict also is that it shows us that really what what runs the the political events and the yeah the political events of the world is society it is not the border like for example we see the united states and britain have their own independent votes in the united nations or or you know whatever say that one feels one way and the other one feels a different way about whatever but in reality, somehow, they always agree on things that are done in Iraq or are done in, regarding the Falklands, uh, Malvinas, or regarding uh, Hong Kong. They're always in agreement. So what does this tell you? That really the world is affected and, and education, through social education, through what people come to believe through the use of language. And the use of language, communications, is very important. The British know it. They know that if you just continue investing in creating, first of all, English has flooded the world and people, whether they like it or not, use it to, um, you know. So anyways, uh, let's continue. Uh, reference has been made to certain resolutions but none of these modify or dilute the obligation of nations to respect the, legal, the legally binding principle of self-determination. So they really, because, you know, who created the rules and principles and, and laws or whatever you call them in the United Nations, international law and what have you, the British, the English, the, 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 the Americans, the English language, the French, and, you know, maybe the Russians a little bit. You know, maybe the Dutch a little bit, but basically the ones who, who, it comes from the League of Nations, and it was, you know, it's their toy basically. You know, it's their toy, so they know how to use their toy. They know, and they have convinced half the world because all of these principles, in in theory, are true and good. You know, but. The matter is how they're being applied. <laughs> you know, what what about the Argentinians' right to self-determination and their right to 
have their territory even from their very, from the day of their founding, from the day of the creation of their country, be respected as an equal nation. Where where is that self determination? Nobody talks about that the right of that self determination. The British use in this case I say the British and I don't mean to single out the British. You know it just so happens to be uh, this situation, but um, and we're talking about this situation. But they they use the principles and values to endow their uh, lo their logistics with uh, worth. Uh, and a worth that sounds very seductive to anybody because we're talking about universal principles, the rights of human beings to freedom and independence and self-determination. And so everybody goes, yeah, they're right. They're right because, you know, the islanders have the right to self-determination. But really we're not talking about how this whole conflict between these two countries actually occurred. And the values and precise um, worth of events as uh, per their equality. You know, you typically you hear, for example, uh, some uh, one of these British guys that argue with us on on Facebook say, you know, if you if you talk about a British pirateer who arrived in whatever Jamaica or something. Yes, we got there first, and we established rule, and blah, 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 blah. Maybe this guy was also born in Holland and worked for London, London and grabbed the islands for King George or whatever. But, you know, it really looks girthy in, in the narrative and the story. And they repeated, uh, you know, copied one time, you know, time after time repeated. Every time it seems to get stronger because the English language gets repeated by everybody. In, uh, who repeats that narrative. And then you have a pirateer that also went to islands. He happened to be from Uruguay or Argentina or somewhere that was just barely starting starting off. And they cascade, they avalanche with, no, but he wasn't really a representative of Argentina. He's a, you know, condescendingly um, putting down historical events, historical figures, like they're not as worthy in their achievements as their equal, their contemporary equal in Britain or in America. And this is what a language dominating the narrative does. You can transmit prejudices and you can transmit condescendence through um, alongside like attached notes to historical events. Because if it happened in Hispanic America, well, you know, it was lesser quality. Like things that come from China are, are poorly made, you know, and kind of that kind of thing. And so, you know, that, this is, but in reality, if you look at all the events and the way Buenos Aires was doing things, they were actually incorporating the islands into their new nation. But they have to attack that. They have to attack the quality and the worth of the individuals, of the events, of the definitions, you know, you weren't, <laughs> in America, when we talk about when America started, we have no problem saying we started when the Mayflower arrived in 15-whatever uh, uh, at Plymouth Rock, and all our school books, and that's when the United States started, and then within the history of the United States, we talk about when we uh, achieved our independence, right? When an Argentinian argues with some of these British guys on Facebook, and they say, well, you know, in 1810, we declared our, our, our country free from Spain and what have you. They really try to use those tools and instruments that are, that are populating uh, international law and definitions and treaties and so forth to try to move it forward, you know, you weren't really uh, officially a republic until 1816, and then, but, you know, whatever constitutional phase did not occur until 1836 or something, you try to make that the date that makes Argentina worthy of being a nation. It's really fascinating, but you learn so much just by listening 
to different mentalities argue or try to build arguments against the other. Okay, so that's the first letter. References have been made to certain resolutions, but none of these modify or dilute the obligation of nations to respect the legally binding principle of self-determination. The United Kingdom government attaches great importance to the principle and the right of self-determination as set out on Article 1st of the article. Okay, so the Argentinians respond by re reminding the United Nations of how they actually view history, well, not view, how act history occurred <laughs> as far as they remember, as, as far as they have documented <laughs> the, the, what happened on the islands. And the British send an attachment, you know, they're not going to, if they just, they really want to make, f force the United Nations to only go by the means the language and the narrative, therefore, thereof, that they have constructed regarding the islands. And so they respond. In accordance with the instructions received, okay, the same, da 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 da, the sort of government of the United Kingdom, I have wanted to refer to the letter dated 30th of December 2020 from the government representative of Argentina to the United Nations addressed to you in response to what they sent before. I should be grateful if you would circulate the present letter and its annex as a document of the general. So you make sure that you include this letter, this this attachment to what we said before. The United Kingdom is clear about both the historical and legal position of the sovereignty of the Falkland Islands. But it doesn't really tell the story. No civilian population was expelled from the Falkland Islands on January 3rd, 1833. That's not true. That's a blatant lie. There are different ways in which you can tell somebody you're not welcome here. You are welcome as long as you accept British rule is a way of telling somebody you're not welcome here. <laughs> but somebody doesn't want to be under British rule. If somebody is offended because their Arch the, the country they respected, they were loyal to, was usurped, was run off, and they are offended, and they do not want to be under British rule, and they say, you can stay as long as you accept me ruling where you live. Of course that's a way of expelling people. But, like I said before, they don't want that to be discussed or observed as such by anybody too much. No civilian. The, an Argentine military garrison had been sent to the Falkland Islands three months earlier in an attempt to impose Argentine sovereignty over British over British sovereign territory. Okay. So they're they're saying this is what we're sticking to. We don't care what anybody else is saying. And they want the reader to believe that Argentine presence started only um, three months earlier, which it did it. It started in 1820, 13 years earlier. But they want you to believe that it started three months earlier when Argentina did send, uh, build a mil military garrison. In fact, there are letters from patriots that were that were saying, you know, send us some prisoners from. We need soldiers. Send us some prisoners from from um, from the Malvinas, that we need more soldiers. And, you know, it's really interesting. The true history is a saga uh, that would make a great Hollywood movie, but it probably wouldn't look... It probably wouldn't be uh, very welcome by the British for a true account in all details uh, as a saga, as a Hollywood movie to be made. Um, but, you know, they want the reader to believe that Argentina just three months before had tried to start building something. Vernet in 1827 already had built a house and there were a, there was a warehouse and there were places to shelter cattle and horses and he even took his piano over 
And this was already, we're talking, 10 years before. But they want, they want the reader to think that only three months before, uh, just when the Argentinians were trying to cheat by building really quickly a military garrison, uh, to impose, again, the selection of words, right? They want Argentina, just like the War of the Falklands. This was an ongoing dispute. For the first time in 150 years, some crazy general decided, you know, we should fight about this. And they invaded to retake the islands from Britain. But all of the English spoken media treated it, somebody started it, somebody started the ball rolling, the story being told a certain way, right? As an attack. Of a, and there were, there were pulls and tugs at first, you know, where some people called it a crisis because they knew they could not not acknowledge the conflict. But eventually, Britain prevailed. With the, with the passing of a few years, Britain prevailed in the story being told as, not in Argentina or, or Spanish, speaking countries, of course, but in most of the English written literature, not all of the written, liter uh, written literature, as an attempt at this renegade country that woke up one night and decided to see if they could take the islands from the British. As that, justifies, of, that justifies, of course, an act of war, uh, turning the, the conflict into a war by Britain. Okay, we're not going to talk about that yet. Um... Yes, they had been sent to the Falklands three months earlier in an attempt to impose their intention on the The United Kingdom immediately protested and later expelled an Argentine military garrison, the Argentine military garrison, on 1833. The civilian population, who had previously sought and received British permission to reside on the island, not true. They're trying to refer to Vernet's dealing with Britain you know, but the people that, the Argentinians that went to the islands and the gauchos and the Uruguayans and the Germans and the Dutch and whoever else through Argentinian harbors arrived at the island uh, did not ask permission from the British. They, the, the people that were on the island, but they, see, it's a very interesting also because you can learn what they are afraid gets interpreted a certain way. You can see, you can tell a lot by seeing how people decide to write a document. Um, they not only want to say Vernet, they don't want to bring attention to Vernet. And so if Vernet was sent to Argentina, why was he dealing and asking permission, quote unquote, from the British as well to do an Argentine commercial venture on the islands? They don't want people to go there. So they just say the people on the islands asked permission from the British. So it's a lie. It's just like the true definition of what is happening today. It's pushing, pushing, and still pulling, trying to take the island, trying to take the islands with with uh, with lies, with half truths, with um, financing the fishing industry, the oil industry, and making it look like it's all the doing of the rightfully possessing of their own sovereign right islanders, nothing to do with Britain, right? And so here too, they try to make it seem like the people there asked us permission to be there. Um, who had previously sought, uh, received British permission to recite on names, was encouraged, oh, this one's cute. The civilian population who had previously sought and received British, per received British permission to reside on the islands were encouraged to remain. So, if, if we could travel in time, guaranteed that the reality of having been there, seeing Onslow's ships with cannons on board, there were warships, arrive to, to depose to bring down the Argentinian flag and, and say, you know, we're here, Her Majesty, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and you were one of the people that were living there. Uh, I doubt that it felt like something, something cordial. You know, everybody probably got upset. There's nothing we can do, you know. A probably, probably completely different situation than what they want to portray in this letter. 
uh, receive it from your side of the country. The majority voluntarily chose to do so. Well, you know, these you got to imagine also that to some people it really didn't matter as long as their lives could go on and, you know, maybe they didn't, maybe they, they weren't born in Argentina, maybe they were from Hungary or wherever, but they, you know, they take these nuances and try to use them to build a different kind, a different narrative, a fictitious practically narrative. The majority, the territorial borders of the Republic, okay, this one's interesting too. The majority, you know, the territorial borders of the Republic of Argentina did not include the geographical southern half of its present day form, nor any territory in the Falkland Islands. Also not true. It is true that Argentina was still sweeping south, sort of like America did going west, and still had not in, still had not considered Patagonia a working part of their country. They kind of knew that this was either going to be Argentinian or Chilean, and there's this big wall between the two countries, uh, so it's going to be ours sooner or later. So they weren't exactly in a hurry either, because this is going to be Argentina. They, they didn't feel in a rush to take Patagonia. However, however, the islands, even before then, were already being administrated from Buenos Aires. So Malvinas was a part of Argentina, was, uh, how can I say this, was Argentinian from its very conception and origin, because the revolution that led to the creation of Argentina started in Buenos Aires, and Malvinas was always part of Buenos Aires, as per the Spanish had made a jurisdiction of Buenos Aires. So that is also a lie, it's not true. So it's really incredible how, which, what shocks me is that, is that um, representatives uh, can, can be so blatantly, uh, can have the nerve to uh, write fictitious uh, descriptions to the United Nations of, of all bodies. It's unbelievable. I was, I was floored when I saw this, and it's kind of what made me want to, I felt I could get away with doing something <laughs> more or less decent. Okay, um, half of them, territory of Falkland Islands, okay, wait, uh, do so, territory of Falkland Islands, did not include, territory of Antar okay, and it did not include, it did not, it says it doesn't, it didn't include the Falkland Islands, but it did, it was, the Malvinas were already part of Buenos Aires, Antarctica, well, nobody was really, uh, or South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, this is very interesting, because, when Argentina um, uh, denounces and claims uh, in the United Nations that South Georgia and Sandwich Islands, along with Malvinas, are part of its claim, it never includes Antarctica. It speaks of the South Atlantic, uh, maybe Antarctic waters, I'm not sure, no, but it doesn't include Antarctica. However, the British already are and, and their belief that they have a right to Antarctica above and beyond the rest of the world, they're already projecting, they're already thinking, you know, we're going to start putting this in writing. We, the, the Argentinians, have been claiming in the United Nations Antarctica, and we all know that there's still a treaty ruling over Antarctica where nobody is to claim it. The British have given it names already. The British have have named three quarters of Antarctica, but they want to turn it around and make it seem like it's Argentina who has pretensions on Antarctica. Argentina does claim a pie-shaped area. Chile does the same. That corresponds to the extensions of its borders, and for some reason, Britain doesn't feel it has the remaining fifth, five sixths of the continent to, to do something with. <laughs> no, it has to overlap Argentina's. It's always seeking conflict with Argentina um, because, 
you know, warring nations thrive through war and confrontation. It's what they're good at, and they, nobody wants to get beaten up, nobody wants to war, nobody wants to send their children to war. And when you are the most powerful country, when you have nuclear weapons, when you have a prowess and knowledge and a whole military institution that goes back centuries, uh, you, you, you can use your military uh, suggestion uh, to uh, create uh, diplomatic conflict because you know that behind, deep, deep underneath, those countries, those little countries that could never stand up to you are thinking, well, do we really want to argue with them? You know, and, and warring countries use that. Clearly, Britain thrives with, with a, politi a policy of confrontationalism, of diplomatic confrontationalism. We don't want to talk. We don't want to discuss. There's no justice to be worked out here. We're just, this is what we say. This is what we want. And this is, you know, well, well, basically that's a way of using your military power to intimidate, uh, which is completely the opposite of what supposedly the United Nations was created for. The opposite. No talking, just imposing your narrative and what you want. <laughs> and and using the intimidation, the suggestion of your military power over uh, any possibility that things get uh, discussed at all. And so it overlaps. It says, you know, ha most of what Argentina claims is claimed by Britain. They can't move over a few degrees and, 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 and look for and want peace for the world since they already claim like four-fifths of the continent. They have to fight over that part that Argentina claims as its little sliver directly below its, pro its territory. And I think it may also overlap to the, on the Chilean side because the Chileans drew their line coming down from their uh, easternmost extreme and Argentina drew their line coming down from their westernmost extreme. And so there's an overlapping that to me is not a big deal between Argentina and Chile. But it, as uh, the British claim kind of says, we don't care about you all. We want part of part of what the Argentinians are claiming and part of what the it's all ours. It's all ours, and we're going to name everything English names, and we don't care about the the, the, the other seven and a half billion people in the world. You know, it's it's what we want. So it's what they want. Okay, um, totally against Jonathan Lovelock against ecological humanity, against the United Nations. It's unbelievable. It's really unbelievable the, the international political policies that Britain has in light of it purporting to be the champion of um, equal rights, democracy, and a, a more orderly, more civil world that, that goes by the United Nations and international agreements of laws of justice and blah 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 when when you, what you see when you read these letters is a country that through the narrative is basically saying we don't care about you we just we're going to want this we're going to take this we're, this is what we're doing it's exactly the opposite um and also you could see it in a in a conference call they just had between some some groups in in the in, in, in the British government and the Falkland Islanders and they had a zoom thing where they talked about the future prospects and how to move on and whatever how to continue developing the Falklands and you know the things that they talked about um, are, were completely alien to what you would think would make sense, appropriate to their reality. Um, one of which would be, you know, let's try to see how we can resolve uh, our conflicts with Argentina and have a good relationship with them because it's the closest and only country <laughs> to these. No, they, this is what's so incredible about these. Countries. They are like on um, the other side of the world from Britain, literally half a planet away almost. And they, um, with all the audacity in the world, exploit the fact that they're so rich 
to connect Britain uh, through the expenditure of a military presence and flights and the building of a harbor and what have you, uh, completely turning their back on perhaps something that would make more sense to be more practic practical, which is to have good relationships with Argentina. It tries to have good relationships with Uruguay and Chile, and it, but it's not always working out for them so well. Um, and when you listen to the to what they talked about, it was all about so that we can be have a stronger presence, so that we can be the hub of other British territories in the South Atlantic, so that we can be a jumping off point for Antarctica, so that we can be stronger before a Chinese presence in the Argentine Sea. I mean, these people are like stuck in 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 uh, in, in the in the world before World War One. You know, they still think that you have to grab as much as you can of the world and be as strong as you can before anybody else even says anything, saying, hey, I think, you know, how about, what about me? You know, all that doesn't matter. Um, they might as well still be the empire that wanted to, that uh, steamrolled over India and uh, Africa. You know, they're just, they just found a, a different way, a different political policy to go about in essence, the same thing, but it's now a different rule, a different book of rules. You know, it's something that sounds more acceptable, or at least seems to be more hidden from recognition. But when you see where they're going, and their policy, and their language, and how they treat Argentina, and what their treaty, post-82 treaty with Argentina, post-82 war with Argentina is all about, it looks just like the post-war, post-World War I treaty with Germany, where they wanted to, you know, hold down Germany and prevent it from, you know, the same thing. You know, when you look at everything, this is still the same country that feels it has more rights to the world than the rest of the countries on it. It really is the same imperialistic mind, thinking of expanding, of getting strong, establishing bases, and yet it, it, it wants to do it now through the mask of a United Nations that seeks peace for the world. Come on. <laughs> um, so now it, 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 it proceeds to establish um, a binary situation, which is, in, which is indispensable, it is essential, to make the British Overseas Territory, we are just defending their self-determination, um, work. They need to establish that that's one thing and we're something else. You know, London is one thing and the Falkland Islanders are something else. That way, through this, tri this triangulation, this binary triangulation of separating uh, what is really not separate, but what appears on the outside to be separate, which is a British overseas territory versus Britain, they go on to say, the United Kingdom's relationship with the Falkland Islands and all its overseas territory is a modern one. <laughs> Don't think anything strange. We're just more evolved. You know, we just got something very modern going on, so don't question it. Is a modern one based on partnership. Sure. <laughs> Shared values and the right of the people of each territory to determine their own future. It's actually a scheme. It's like a scam, a ploy. Gibraltar, these overseas territories are a way of saying, world, don't think that we're being expansionist. Don't think that we're grabbing more for ourselves without caring what anybody else wants or says or complains about. The, we're just doing this for them, we're just protecting, we're just encouraging them to be independent, to be self-determining, we're helping their own free determination, their own free will. But in reality, <laughs> they don't want to, they don't, you know, you can tell that Britain decides if it's going to let go. Sometimes it's not so convenient to keep the, 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 the gig going, it's not so convenient anymore to keep whatever um, 
colonial situation going. I think it just happened somewhere in, in the Caribbean. And so they're willing to let go of it, which is very useful because by doing that, by allowing some territories to break off and really gain independence from them, it makes it appear like their little ploy of overseas territories is not a ploy. It is real. It is really them protecting. But the ruling interest, the ruling interest comes from London. And London has its preferences. And London can go either way. It, can, it could continue the same thing of, of, of a binary islanders versus Britain situation if they gained independence because they would turn it into like an orbiting um, satellite commonwealth little country and you know they would continue to upgrade it but it would always as long as it's at the service of British interests they will find ways of making sure that it appears like they're independent but they're still good and useful to Britain so and that is made plainly obvious when they talk about using uh, the Malvinas or the Falklands as a jumping off or as a hub for uh, development of the South Atlantic. Who's going to develop the South Atlantic? Who's going to fish the entire South Atlantic, develop the shores of Antarctica? The Falklanders? <laughs> you know? It's Britain, but they make it, they want the world to think, oh, it's it's like a little like a, a, a thing, a network, right? And a world that needs to be shared by one humanity, and this goes back to Gaia humanism, where all water is shared by all people, all clouds, all contamination, all oceans, everything is shared by one humanity where we're not divided. The only thing that makes organic sense is as far as order and uh, administration of nations is for there to be equal nations. One nation with their its metropolis, it's, it's, or if it wants to have several capitals, as long as it's one nation, perhaps the same language, perhaps not the same language, but that is what makes the world equal. That's what would make a United Nations truly be fair and if it were you know, reconfigured and transformed, it's what would, it would make it work. Um, but Britain pretends that all other nations, yes, are individual separated nations, but they can have commonwealth, they can have overseas territories, they have all different, and this may not seem like a huge deal to some people, perhaps they could even find arguments, but it does, it does create an injustice in international politics. Because when you have to argue, like in this case, Argentina versus Britain over these islands, or Spain and England over Gibraltar, all of a sudden your arguments find three bases instead of two bases from which, on which to stand on. So while Argentina is trying to talk about the singular story shared on those islands between Britain and Argentina, Britain can say, what, what, I don't know what you're talking about. It's really about, you're saying something about the history on those islands, and we are concerned with the people who are now living there and their right to self-determination. So they turn it into three points of argument. Versus two, that the Argentinians would be arguing. The Argentinians are not really, not really concerned with the others because it has always and only been about Argentina and Britain. It's always, that's always been clear. The British wanted to be about the islanders, which is different. And they wanted the Argentinians to deal with the islanders. If, if the British had succeeded in having Argentina recognized the islanders as a body in itself and created this binary trend made them agree to this binary tri triangulation it could go, it could have gone either way for britain it could really have benefited them because then they can continue saying well you know we don't really care all that much we we care about what's just we care about what's fair 
we care about what these islanders want. And Argentina would have said, oh, really? Oh, okay, well, let's continue talking about it that way. But also what could have happened is that Argentina could have said, okay, uh, right, let's talk about it in, in, in the sense of three points. Now, explain to me again how they're independent and you have nothing to do with them. Argentina could have turned the three-point binary situation into something that revealed the lie of British overseas territories. The, so the fact that they pretend like they don't care all that much and it's all about them when in reality it's about the British. Um, they could have made, exposed that before the world. But, you know, this would be it's too intelligent, too um, complex for uh, perhaps to expose to the world and may have fizzled out and not worked for the Argentinians. But that's what I always think about when the British insisted that the islanders were represented uh, that time some years ago um, when Kimmerman was still alive and the Argentinians got offended and upset because they saw it as forcing Argentina to play by the rules of this triangulation where they had to recognize and acknowledge the islanders right to their own um, exclusive self-determination as as Britain would infer without saying uh, ever all the way <laughs> and they were afraid that they were going to uh, in, uh, empower the British by acknowledging that and so they withdraw and the, the British of course took advantage of that to make it seem once again how the you know these these hooligans that wanted to take territory from us are now afraid of respecting the islanders and so they can continue their uh, defamation and their attack on the Argentinian character and the Argentinian argument and so they used it uh, in their favor but um I always feel it was a shame that the Argentinians should have taken them up on that and then grabbed it from them and shown the world what they're actually doing with British overseas territories to the rest of the planet. Um, let's try to wrap this up. Is a modern one based on partnership, blah, 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 civil rights, and blah, 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 blah. As such, the United Kingdom remains committed to defending the rights of the people. Of, you know, the United Kingdom, how come, you know, if I was Argentina, I, I would just be crazy. I would just have a field day. I would say, how about you acknowledge your responsibility and accountability for putting people in harm's way? For after Argentina entering in conflict, in 1834, a year after you took the islands from Argentina, entering in conflict with Argentina, saying, we don't care about your protests, we're putting people here to make sure that you, it's harder for you to take them back. Why don't you acknowledge, as a government, that you're responsible for the predicament that the islanders are in? Nobody ever thinks of saying that. Sometimes I go crazy, wishing I could be the Argentine government. And there's just so many things that you could say in the war. I mean, do you care so much about the islanders that you were willing to risk dozens of them getting bombed and killed um, by the Argentinians? They never would have done it, but, you know, when you start a war, you're saying all bets are off. You're saying, okay, it's war now. And the Argentinians made sure that the islanders were, were protected, that nobody hurt them. In fact... The only islanders that died in that war were because of friendly fire from the British. Three ladies, you know, also a story that they're, <laughs> they're hoping will disappear. Uh, but it certainly wasn't. But what they do is they try to villainize the Argentinians, the Argentinian soldiers and poor kids that were never grew up in a war-minded society, nor were they trained. They were conscripts and, you know, they were... Anyways, uh, they wanted to character defame the Argentinians and say that, you know, they, they took dumps all over the post office and whatever stupid stuff, silly stuff that happens in wars. I mean, um, I, when I argue with, you know, do you know what actually happens in wars in the Middle East and, 
the Second World War. I mean, this was like a walk in the park. Uh, you could probably, uh, you know, yell at the Argentinians and intimidate them. The, you know, this that war happened because Britain needed a war to happen on the islands. It, it didn't ever, it never offered Argentina uh, a peaceful exit. It never, it, yeah, withdraw, withdraw completely, go all the way back home so that we can come back and retake the islands. That's the only offer Britain ever offered. They never said, well, let's resolve this conflict in a peaceful way. Let's avoid war somehow. No, because it was in the interest of Britain and America to have war on these islands. And if one of the consequence was, um, was that the islanders would be left scorned, and intimidated, or not intimidated, but angry and resentful at the Argentinians, uh, more power to the British, because that's a way of fueling a new kind of uh, artificially spun patriotism. All of a sudden, they're all British, and they're all like waving British flags, you know. Before they weren't like that. Before they weren't so fanatical about Britain. In fact, some people, some people on the islands didn't, want to consider themselves as British or English or what have you, you know. But uh, that wasn't working for the British because they weren't really, they never were scared of the Argentinians. Uh, they saw their claim of the islands as really inconsequential that they were never going to do much about it anyways. And they, the Argentinians were collaborating. They were going over there, they were doing stuff, they were building infrastructure at one point. Uh, and Britain didn't like that. And so it stands to reason that it's very likely that the British and the Americans created um, a diplomatic environment or a, uh, an environment of information that allowed the junta to continue believing that if they took back the islands through a military invasion, they could get away with Britain not responding militarily and uh, Britain would want to negotiate. And of course! Of course. I mean, these are not people that said, I want to kill 600 Argentinians uh, because we're going to lose for sure, which would have been the logical deduction anybody would have made. They went to, they did this invasion because for some reason they believed Britain was, Britain was not going to respond. And as soon as they landed on the island, wouldn't you know, the British were just more than, more than decided on what they were going to do. It's almost like they were planning on it. I don't know how old people are. But if you're as old as I am, and you remember the news, you can, you can attest to the fact that something was very strange about this confrontation. These were two countries that are completely unlikely to ever... Why would there be a war between Argentina and Britain? Um, there was no animosity, and there, was all, there were all these... But... Um, the, also, the the uh, military occupations were happening, uh, supported by the United States against subversive infiltration uh, in Latin American countries, and so there's all this bad blood and and um, power struggles or what have you, and so the the whole era was very interesting. But in any case, in that mess, it's very likely that. You know, it, it is not, Britain wants to pretend that this was something they weren't counting on and they were totally shocked by Argentina's belligerency and they had no choice but to honorably defend themselves. In reality, what happened was that most likely Britain, when they started seeing that, that the Argentinian junta was talking about the, this possible uh, action, um, and that the Argentinian people themselves were completely oblivious. They have, they never in a mil, none, no Argentinian in all of Argentina would have ever imagined in a million years that something like this, it just completely stunned everybody. It, they, 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 they sprung the war overnight. People woke up. No, everybody in the country woke up knowing that the junta had done this the, the following morning. So, did Britain want to make sure that none of that changed? That uh, you know that there, that the that the that the junta did not uh, uh, retreat 
and, 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 and uh, avoided their ambition because of whatever, very likely, because everything that happened with the war, because of the war, and after the war, and every single sentiment in people that you hear, especially now, this patriotism, even in British people, some British people didn't know where the Falklands were in 82. They, and they, they were much more, they friendlier towards the Argentinian, but thanks to the animosity created through the war, now you have people that will, in Britain, that will just stubbornly, without even knowing the truth, or caring, or using human empathy, or caring about history, I mean to say, will just basically, almost fascistically, but patriotically, side with the British narrative, and say, this is our, these are our islands, and there are our islands, and there are our islands, not to mention the islanders, and so the war was very useful to Britain in this social aspect, in this social sense. And do you think that countries with the experience, with the war experience that Britain, France, America, and European countries have, they were not anticipating such repercussions? In fact, after the war, uh, the Argentinians were left completely numb. They did not know what happened. And the, they just wanted to get rid of the junta. Uh, they were already wanting to get rid of the junta from before the war. But of course, the British loved to say that it was thanks to the war. Thanks to the war, you know, the, the Argentinians were saved from the junta. Well, you know, it wasn't because of something the British planned. Obviously, the war made it worse for the Argentinians, but they were already uh, trying to, um, to get rid of them. And in any case, the last thing from their mind was to um, feel a sense of revenge or adamant or just angry at Britain or saying, you know, we're not going to take this. We're going now. We're, we're going to prepare for uh, uh, whatever. No, the Argentinians went the other way. They started going into some kind of strange, chaotic depression. They they took it out on their own police, their own military. Everybody got. Uh, they were in denial. It was the opposite from a, a, a spring back sort of anger that you would feel if, if, if there was something that normally, like it normally happened to me. I don't know. But in any case, regardless of if it was normal or not, if the well-being and the prosperity and the self-determination of the islanders was really what the British most want for these people, it was right in front of them. It was the easiest thing they could have done to say, hey, don't take it out on the Argentinians. The Argentinian people did not want this. It was the junta. They're getting rid of the junta. Uh, you know, they hate the junta, they hate everything that they did. That junta was uh, their enemy as much as it was your enemy because they genocidally killed them. They were a victim of the junta as much as the islanders. They could have easily educated or informed the islanders in this truth about what happened. But no, the British were silent about that about how things really were, about how the Argentinians did not hate the islanders, they had no antagonistic ideas at all towards the islanders. And the Argentinians never thought of the islanders as, as their enemy. They had a problem with Britain. You know, they really didn't think all that much about the islanders. However, the war naturally caused a resentment in the islanders that Britain did absolutely nothing to appease in fact, it used it because now it had its work cut out for it. They don't have to worry anymore about Argentinian islander collaboration. The islanders have want nothing to do with the Argentinians after the war. In fact, they kind of fueled that narrative. The invasive Argentinians, they want to take your, your right to self-determination and blah, 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 blah. If they really cared about the islanders, they would have talked about the, re the real details of the conflict, why it occurs, why it happened, why it occurred, what it's about. And they would have said, uh, 
let's find a resolution that you're always going to be happy with. Maybe it means never being uh, Argentine sovereignty, but you have to be friends with the Argentinians because you know, they're right there and you, everything will be one-fifth the cost of us maintaining you from Britain. If British, the British really wanted what is best for the islanders, they would have promoted that idea. But what they did instead is they fortified the notion of antagonism that naturally occurs as a reaction from the war with a base, a disproportional, stupidly large military base, tells it, okay, that's what's coming now. Um, let's continue. The United Kingdom's relation with the Cohen chart of Kingdom of Falklands and all its overseas territories, modern Western. As such, it remains committed to defending the rights of the people on the Falklands to determine their own political, social, economic future. The United Kingdom rejects the statement of Argentina developed uh, Argentine government that these developments are contrary to a general resolution and reiterates its uh, unequivocal support for the right of the Falklanders to develop their natural resources for their own economic benefit, as if nothing ever happened. So, if you have a fight with a friend over something, and things are not resolved, things are not settled, there's no closure, there's no understanding, there's no resolution to the f argument you had, the furthest thing from your mind will be to continue uh, using your friend's whatever, which has to do with why you fought in the first place. But in this case, the United Kingdom uses its military intimidation to that diplomatically s silences Argentina because it's more, more worried about its economic situation with Europe and what have you, to uh, further its policy. Because if the if Britain can get the islanders to a level where they're truly maybe running their own industry, investing in their own, becoming a richer population that maybe becomes uh, administratively more autonomous, of course, the world will find it harder and harder to go back in history and see where Argentina is right, and it will weaken the Argentinian claim before basically the passing of time. And so, this is British policy. This is the policy of the British with the islands is to uh, disrespect completely because the United Nations did say something. Don't change the conditions. But they, the United Nations was not allowed to, to elaborate too much on that, obviously, because of British influence, possibly. Um, but it stands to reason that the, the priority for the country, for both countries and for the United Nations, is for the conflict to be resolved and ended. If you do not resolve and end the conflict, you cannot continue trying to promote and push your British overseas territory narrative and, and, and create and finance industries and then continue lying by saying that it's theirs and they made it and they built it and, they, you know, uh, they don't depend on us, all these lies, which are blatantly, blatantly trying to, trying to hurry up and try to beat Argentina off the islands. And this is what's most interesting, is that for 188 years, the British have never, everything that you hear and see about what the islanders say, what they publish, what they write, the books and manifestos, the, the articles, the Merkel Press, a complete uh, propaganda internet publication, everything. And if you read through Merkel Press, oddly, uh, without being obvious, you see this positive story about Uruguay, positive maybe about Brazil, or negative about perhaps, but really positive about Chile, positive. Story. In Argentina, it's always like struggling country, you know, this is not working out for them. And it's always about the fault, and, and then they lie, Merkel Press lies to the world by, by suggesting in its title that the Falcon Islands are part of Mercosur, blatantly. They call their publication Merkel Press. Merkel Press, which means, which is a takeoff, Mercosur, 
the economic block created by Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, Paraguay. You know, and, and so they try to get in there, use their, um, use the, what do you call it, the prestige created by the, the title of an economic block to say we are part of it, and from within, they promote the island <laughs> economically. It's, it's so blatant, it's so audaciously, um, just in your face, mocking you, like saying, we will lie. We will completely lie and tell the world that we're part of Merkel Sur, so we can, from within, always talk about us as if, as if we were part of Merkel of Merkel Sur. And they put the presidents. The, they put a banner with the pictures of of South American presidents, and you know, and if South America is possibly is actually of all the political blocks or economic blocks or whatever you want to call it in the world, the one that is least favorable to recognizing the Falklands as uh, not Argentinian but British. Uh, of all the countries in the world, South America, and especially Mercosur, is the one block that is will least agree with any country. The, the, it's the block that will most support Argentinian and British negotiations over the sovereignty, and yet they purport being part of them and promote themselves economically in their store, like they matter, like they have all this presence in the world. And, and so it's like the British are continuing to try to pull the islands from Argentina. That's what's so interesting, is that their propaganda and their finagling and all this all these strategies, you know, of, of sending Falkland Islanders to international sports events as if they were a little country with their little flag, and they do all these things, it's almost like they're still trying to take the islands from Argentina. It's really incredible. Yet they say, we are sovereign. We are... If they really were, <laughs> that's why the, the binary um, triangulation is, is a blatant lie, because this is how it's used. It, it's used to be able to create a narrative of independence and human, uh, self uh, rights, uh, human rights of self-determination, and blah, blah, blah. But in reality, it's engineering, it's in the benefit of the metropolis of Britain. Uh, and they do it through acting like the Falklands is its own country. Uh, but in reality, it's not, you know. It's, uh, it's, they're doing the same thing with Gibraltar, by the way. It's the same thing. They talk about the people in Gibraltar, the people in Gibraltar, and they don't, and really Gibraltar is a trophy um, uh, blackmail, you know, just like the Malvinas, just like they blackmail uh, Argentina with not favoring them internationally in the, econo in the world of economy and finances if they're not friendly about the dispute, if they don't tone it down a little bit. And so there, it is not coincidence I'm talking about Gibraltar having uh, been a way in which Britain gave Spain peace by create, by stipulating in a treaty, the peace treaty, that Gibraltar would be them. Gibraltar would be them, like they did with Hong Kong. You know, we'll stop beating you up if you give us this land. Expansionist, imperialistic mentality, and it still goes on with Argentina and the and the, and the Malvinas they still think that they're more important than the rest of the nations in the world. And, um, and that they have more right to the world, and more right to the resources of the world than other countries. Um, unless you're a rich country that's doing the same thing with them. But in any case, let me not divert too much. Um, so, yeah, well, anyways, I, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, uh, Natural resource economic benefit, law including three laws. Oh, okay. So the United Kingdom rejects any of the statement that the Argentine government of the Argentine government that these developments are contrary to General Assembly Resolution 3149 and reiterates its unequivocal support I wasn't paying attention. Rejects the statement of the Argentine government that these developments are contrary Right. It's saying, No, we're just helping the islanders. We're not we're not we're not using this logistically to try to strengthen our our grabbing of the islands. You know, we're not 
I don't know what they're talking about. Um, uh, and again, they want to make it about the islanders' rights. That's why it's so useful to have British overseas territories, because they can make it about the islanders' rights. It is their Falcon Islanders' right to develop their natural resources for their own economic benefit. So the Argentinians, imagine if you're Argentinian, how insulted you feel. And you know what the thing is? I believe personally that countries like Britain use offense and insult to stoke the smoldering and uh, augment conflict through which they can benefit, like I explained before. And so by offending and insulting, it's, it's, it's the way um, scallies or, or um, mafia bullies, you know, in the suburbs uh, will pick a fight, you know, without raising their hand first. They'll say, you know, I, I met your, your mother was a pretty nice person. She was really nice to me last night. And so the person who understands very well what you're saying will raise, want to beat them up. And then the British say, ah, they attacked me. This is <laughs> one of their key <laughs> instruments. I'm not saying just the British. I'm saying possibly all military powers have used that from the Romans to the British and the Persians and uh, Americans, I don't know, Martin Garcia, what is that, Diego Garcia? The same thing, you know, very astutely, the British made it seem like they were giving back the islands to Mauritius, but uh, what they, who's going to say anything to the United States, who they made a secret agreement with to let them have the islands for military use you know, regarding the Middle East. You know, so much lying, just so much lying going on. And, and all through the United Nations, that's what's unbelievable. It's, it's an insult to the world, saying we created this to bring peace and to bring unity and to make a better world. In reality, it's being used to maintain the richer, richer, the more powerful, more powerful, you know. Um... And yet, I don't believe the United Nations should be dismantled. I, I believe it needs to be reconfigured completely, transformed, turned into, uh, uh, redesigned, in other words, by all countries, by all countries and complete and total equality. Um, can you send a message to people on that one? The Republic of Argentina regularly refers to regional statements of di diplomatic support for sovereignty negotiations. Yeah, there are several blocs and organizations and, uh, you know, the African, uh, the 77 here, the, the Latin American there, you know, there, at different times there have been statements of support for negotiations. Just for, just for Britain and Argentina to say, okay, let's talk about this. That is what Britain doesn't want and fights against. They fight against the dispute being talked about openly and freely before the world. They want to put it inside the International Court of Justice, you know, where they know how it works and they know what to pull and, and when and where to do what and how. You know, they don't want it to just basically be talked about openly and sincerely before the world. And this is what the countries keep asking. Talk about it. Negotiate it. Resolve it. Which proves Britain is more interested in maintaining a, a, a scheme of confrontation because it knows how to thrive through antagonism and confrontation and intimidation and fear and insecurity. It, it, if you have the guns, if you have the money, if you have the language, obviously it's in your interest to have the world upset because that's, chaos doesn't know how to use administrative systems and rules as well and as calmly as those that have power over a situation. So it's, it, these are countries, the warring countries are nations that have learned to use situations of belligerency, war, confrontation, provocation, 
to become richer, to make deals, to make treaties and agreement where they give the, the they have the last word, when, where they take the last step, where they uh, conclude things a certain way. And every one of those is a step in their benefit before the world. So uh, this is, you know, this is how the, the United Nations is not really, is not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, however, none of these modify or dilute the obligation on states to respect the legality binding principle of self-determination. This means there can be no dialogue on sovereignty unless the Falkland Islanders wish so. Again, they always go back to hammering the same thing. Because it's what it's the formula that has got the world fooled. And so they're not going to let go of that because 90% of the world still hears that, doesn't see the mechanisms behind, the true mechanisms behind, and says, well, sure, it sure sounds like Britain is right on this, you know? And then a few things that are thrown in to shore that up and enhance it and People, of course, then go, yeah, I believe that too, because if this is true, then that must be true also. This means there can be no dialogue on Sarmana. The 2013 referendum, which, uh, okay, I spoke about the referendum already, 99% of those who voted wanted to remain their current status and territory of the United Kingdom sent a clear message that the people of the island do not want dialogue on sovereignty. They're just masters at using language to echo those principles that we have all been politically in our even in our layman reality trained to believe are righteous and true so now we can you know these countries and it's not just britain obviously it's, they're all doing that in the united nations as soon as they have some power in communications uh but you know the the victims in in situations you see have are less interested in manipulating with prowess this condition of language uh, and principle and values uh, that uh, uh, purport to sustain righteousness. Um, you know, there are terms, you know, uh, the Palestinians will mention a right to self-determination, so, but they really, uh, the, the, the sort of the victims or the losers uh, before the, the big countries with the power do not orchestrate in this vast world of of control and, and dominance uh, of this scheme as as well as the ones that invented and designed the United Nations and the International Court of Justice. And additionally, um, the government of Argentina regularly refers to the military. Oh, let's see if anybody wants has a question or anything. Just a little handsome, okay. Um, the government of Argentina regularly refers to the military presence in the in the Falkland Islands. The United, okay, this is interesting. Uh, it's more interesting. It's one of the ones that just pow. You go, what is who's not see who's not seeing this? You know. Additionally, the government of Argentina regularly refers to the military presence in the Falkland Islands. The United Kingdom's forces in the South Atlantic are entirely defensive and are at the appropriate level to ensure the defense of the Falkland Islands against any potential threat. In fact, the United Kingdom's military presence has significantly reduced over time. The United Kingdom continues to keep its force levels under review. Argentina has not a single base opposite the Falklands. It has no training programs to invade the Falklands, to attack. Uh, it doesn't even have training programs to defend the country against the British, who happen to be right there pointing their guns at Argentina. And yet, it's it's a military that's, I don't know, if you, if you, if you factor in technology and, and modern capacity and communications with all of the NATO countries of the world and what have you, it's like comparing, uh, you know, one to a hundred, the military, Argentine military to the British military presence on the island. And yet they have the audacity, <laughs> the audacity to say 
that they're there to defend the islands against, how did I say it? The, the kingdom forces the Sutherland entirely defensive and are an appropriate level, appropriate level, the appropriate level to make sure the Argentinians don't, you know, wake up one day and say, hey, let's go invade the islands again, hey, let's see what happens, would be one-tenth, one-tenth of what they have right now would be more than enough. I mean, even less, perhaps. They're, they have some some equipment and some stuff that could possibly down whatever boat or plane Argentina, you know, and they're prepared now, and they they are trained, and they have studied uh, Argentina like they never have studied its military capacity before, as Donald Trump would say. One, you know, 5% of what they have now would be enough to make sure it doesn't happen again, although the Argentinians are on the opposite end of the spectrum of planning anything. So it's complete a complete lie, okay? It's a complete lie to say that that base is there as a defensive means appropriate uh, to what... There's nobody interested in the Falklands. <laughs> No one, no one, <laughs> Russian, Iran, not even, you know, no, no one, China, no, you know, but the, this is the thing, a belligerent, war-prone country eventually will succeed in causing a belligerent war uh, situation to develop, a context of, so if you continue saying, you know, we're going to defend against you, you're like, defend against what? We're, we're, I don't care, we're just going to keep pointing all our ten guns at you just in case you decide to go buy a gun. Well, you know what? That country is possibly going to say, well, maybe we should buy a gun. You know, maybe we should talk to China and Russia. And After all, they could invade us if they wanted to. And it stands to reason, imagine if any country, France, America, Denmark, whatever country, was sitting there with a proportionate, uh, aggressive military base aimed at that country. Because the base, they're, they're not saying it, but basically they're saying it. The base is there because of Argentina. So if we had, if the Chinese, or if the, if the Liberians, or if the Mozambicans, or Madagascarians had an enormous military base uh, in Mexico aimed at at the southwest of the United States. <laughs> you know, how long would it take us to have nuclear weapons aimed just in case? You know, even if that military base was aiming towards Guatemala instead of the United States, we would still have a huge, just in case, because it's all about prevention and making sure that you know, what, what was that? Gun supporters say, you know, the greatest, the best guarantee against somebody using a gun is having a gun yourself, whatever. But the Argentines don't do any of that. They don't have any kind of reaction or response to this gargantuan military base that has been aiming at them from the Malvinas, from the Falklands for the last uh, 30 years, you know. They've never done anything to defend themselves, and yet the British have the audacity, the audacity to say to the United Nations that they must have that military best base there to defend themselves against the Argentinians. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, they're just laughing at us. They're making a mockery of the nations of the United Nations. They're laughing, ah, we can tell, you can say anything. It doesn't matter as long as it sounds like it's making sense, right? Uh, the means, there can be no, uh, let the binding principles of this means, which also, by the way, hints at the fact that the war in 1982 was by the junta that was instantly diffused and put out like a, like, like a cigarette <laughs> bud was instrumental and wanted, sought, and created, because in fact it wasn't a war until the British sent the task force to combat the Argentine uh, reoccupation of the islands. The Argentinians you know, said, leave the islanders alone, they kicked out the governor, they fought the royal whatever, 
the Royal Marines, and then they just occupied the islands, and they started doing silly things like, you know, we're all gonna, you're all gonna drive on the right from now on, you know, and whatever, raise the Argentinian flag at the sky. That's, you know, it was nothing. The British had a hundred billion uh, opportunities to, or, or rather, routes and possibilities in cahoots with America, with Europe. How long do you think Italian and Spanish or in Greek, Portuguese, whatever, neutrality or half support for Argentina would have lasted if the British said, we want, really, we want to resolve this peacefully. We won't go down there. We'll leave the islanders alone. Just pull back. And we promise we won't take back the islands, for example. Which is something that maybe the Argentinian junta would have considered. If, if the British had said, we won't take back the islands, we'll work this out somehow. Uh, let's find a peaceful solution. Eventually, the Portuguese, the Greek, the Italians, the Spanish, you know, they would have started saying, come on, Argentina, you know, really, you're the bully here. But no, uh, that was never going to be the case because Britain needed a war, for all the reasons I explained before, to happen. And they, they didn't let the, the junta breathe. They didn't let them be able to save face even for a fraction of a second in order to maybe turn around. They kept the pressure on and they were just trigger happy. They sent that, they, it was regaining their pride, it was everything for Thatcher and it was also the destruction of a friendship relationship. You know, up to that point Britain had said, please come fight with us against Russia and the Argentinians would have sent soldiers. Because we, the Argentinians saw the British and the French as their, their uncles, you know, Europeans, European, whatever, and anything the British said was always right and beautiful and great, and, you know, if that had absolutely no political value for Mar Margaret Thatcher, that she was so ignorant in this way, diplomatically, uh, she, she and her government put the advancement, the expansion, of British influence onto the South Atlantic before the importance of a Hispanic, South American, of Argentina, of a, a country that had a, a very unique relationship of respect and friendship where basically the Argentinians would do anything the British asked them to do because they loved them, they thought they were great, they thought they were the cat's meow. And uh, Mr. Leach and Margaret Thatcher in London just poop, poop, poop all over that. They just said, that doesn't mean nothing. What matters is that we have more, that we grab more, that this is ours and that nobody pushes us around and, and that we can change the situation to our favor. We can have a situation where the, from now on the Falkland Islanders will be, yes, 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 we're British, we're British, do whatever, whatever you want. Make, you're going to make us rich, yay, make us rich, you know, we're not... We're never going to, we hate Argentinians. We hate them. We're not, don't worry about that ever again. And the British said, okay, this looks really good for us. Because it will be a lot easier. We'll never have to, we'll change 180 degrees the situation. No more Argentinian ventures of collaboration. No more need to discuss history and resolving the conflict. And now we can force this, uh, our, our, our strategy of self-determination and the Islanders right and all that story. We can just enforce that and there will never be a crack. We, we will have the opportunity to not allow for any glimmer, any glimpse of what would be normalcy, friendship, solution, because we can keep the Islanders always resentful with a parade every year, you know, on Liberation Day. And so the war worked beautifully and the more you think about it, the more you start wondering. I wonder if there wasn't some secret operation, because it just worked out so well at, in so many levels for the British. And it seems so illogical that military trained people with knowledge of the history of war would just believe that um, they would win a war against a nuclear power. They obviously believed something else. They obviously believed that they would never go to war with Britain for whatever reason that has been buried completely underground. 
and which perhaps is the most important thing that Britain would not want ever to be suspected that the Americans and the British were in cahoots about making sure this war happened because they knew how it was all going to work out later. Additionally, the government of Argentina regularly refers to the military presence in the Falkland Islands. The United Kingdom's, oh, I read that already, the United Kingdom and the Falkland Islands government remain willing to discuss areas of mutual interest. The nerve! <laughs> we will insult you and offend you, but we're open for you doing business with us. This is what always gets me about English and American, French and what have you, these powers, their policies and their ex-colonies and, and countries that they're, they've invaded, infiltrated or intervened, that they insult their, the fabric of their nation. They kill their presidents. They, they uh, you know, lie about how a war was actually the reasons for why a war was created, what have you. And then they'll go back saying, you know, but you know what, we're willing to do business with you. It's almost, you know, if you had this in the social realm of how people treat each other, it would be like basically your friend saying, you know, um, slapping you around, taking your stuff, <laughs> having sex with your girlfriend. And then the next morning, coming around and, and saying, hey, look, I, I got this for sale. You want to buy it? You want to buy my used car? You know, how about it? I'll give it to you a special price. And I, I, just, I just had sex with your girlfriend. But, you know, if, if we could put it... Yet countries, it's unbelievable. And, and the world is, tra is trained to, has been trained to believe. You hear intellectuals say, yeah, nations relate to each other through interests, through uh, invested interests and, and benefit and whatever, and as if there was no offense, no insult, no, no, nothing that really affected a population, you know, uh, as if, you know, it's unbelievable how, now with other countries, uh, they have, other countries have been compensated abundantly for bombing their, them with nuclear weapons, you know, to where they have helped them become economic powers like Japan, but not because they felt bad about how they obliterated them, their children, but because it was most convenient for America to have uh, obedient, tame, uh, economic powerhouses be their friends. The problem with uh, Argentinians is that they have always been renegades that believe in your in their own right to republic and freedom, and at the same time they contradict themselves and they and they always give in. Half of them always give in, whatever. But what the British, I believe, learned some place so at some point before the war, perhaps uh, during the Peronist era, is that the Argentinians saw themselves as their own country and, and they were well educated and versed in all the many ways that Britain had intervened and meddled with South American countries and their own history starting with their and how they tried to invade Buenos Aires in 1806 and 1807 and how they tried to invade their right to the Paraná River uh, by you know and creating creating, uh, provoking differences between Chile, Peru, Bolivia, uh, Uruguay, you know, there are uh, South American nations, especially in the southern cone, are very versed in this aspect of their history regarding Britain. So at some point, I think that before Thatcher, Britain started saying, you know what, these people are always going to give us grief, so for, you know, for events that happened in the past, just give up on them, you know. Just use them, you know, manipulate them, draw plans against them. They're no longer, we can no longer count on their uh, passive loyalty. And I think that this is probably something that played into uh, why the United States and, and Britain agreed to go, you know, go ahead and, and fool the junta into, uh, into a war, making them think that we're, you know, there was 
you know, the United States were going to stay out of it, and then at the very last minute they said, well, again, we have to support Britain when the soldiers were already there, and, you know, to time the, the situation uh, carefully so that to make sure that the junta continued advancing and, and at the same time make it seem like they didn't want the war, but they really did. Okay, so anyways, uh, that's it. That's the conclusion, that's the last paragraph of this response by Britain uh, to the United Nations. And let me know whatever you think of it, whatever you thought of it, or any questions that you might have. Close current tabs. Okay.